about what God is doing and, and how he's watching over his children and preparing us and getting us ready to go back to Crossway Worship Center to our, our actual facility. Uh, we'll be there next week. Uh, it's just a trial run for our team. But you'll be seeing us live from, from Trackside Worship Center. So Trackside at, actually Crossway Worship Center at Trackside. Uh, so you can be able to join us there as we gather together. But you can join us on the internet because the following week will be our official day that we actually uh, start up and launch out. And that will be on August the 16th. August 16th will be the day that you'll be able to join us back there again. So we're excited to have you back on Sunday, August 16th. And you'll see us coming live from there this coming Sunday. So we're excited about that. I want to read something for you that really touched my heart. I was reading it today, and it goes along with what we're about to do. We're about to enter into worship, enter into praise, and to lift up his name higher than any other. It says, Rejoice in Psalms 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. It's all about worshiping God. It's about the importance of entering in as we begin to praise the Almighty Lord. We stand in awe of His majesty and His might. He goes on to sing unto Him a new song. Give a new song in your heart this morning. A song of praise, a song of worship. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word, capital W word, not the word, capital W word, which is Jesus. Word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loves righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Did you hear that? Everything was made by a spoken word of God. And I pray this morning that God would speak into your heart, into your life, and you would feel a ministry to you as we sing songs of praise and worship. By the breath of his mouth, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the depth in storehouses. And this part here, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. We will be standing today in awe of the mighty God. And as we sing praises to the King of Kings, lift our hands, lift our hearts to him. And know that he wants to touch you right in your house, right where you are today. And he wants to minister to you. And he wants to fill your life with goodness and mercy. Amen. Let's bow our heads open in prayer as we go to the Lord in worship and praise. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this morning, for coming to you, Lord, that we can gather together and praise your holy name. That we can lift that name up. That we can, in the midst of every situation, we can lift our hands to heaven and say, God... You've got it all in control. You've got it in control. So, Lord, this morning I pray that you would, would mightily bless the worship team as they, as they lead us to, the, to your throne room in praise and worship. That you mightily bless the word. That you mightily touch the entire service this morning. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. Lord, be with us as we lift up your name. For holy is the Lord, worthy of all praise and honor and adoration. Praise you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lead us. To the Lord in praise and worship. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us. Lord, be with us. Hallelujah. Empower us, Holy Spirit. We need you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for sending the Comforter, for sending the Holy Ghost to be with us, to fill us with the fruit of the Spirit.
praise you because you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all honor and glory. Hallelujah. We thank you for everything you've done, Lord. And you have sacrificed yourself for us so that we could live in eternal life. We could live in eternal joy and eternal peace. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to come today, Lord, to anoint our minds and our hearts. Let your spirit talk to us and guide us through your word today. Lord, bless Pastor Jim and lead him as he preaches your word, Lord. Open our ears and our minds. Open our hearts to what you would want us to know about you, about your son, and about your plans for us. Because you have truly great plans for those who love you, for those who want to be saved, for those who want to release all the hell that they carry. Lord, all the trouble they carry, all the crisis they carry, the shame they carry, Lord. Lord, we want everyone, Lord, to come to you to find that life and light that only you can give. Because the Father is good, and his Son is good, and his plans for us are good. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Center of Wilton, Connecticut, and I'm very grateful to be offered the opportunity by our pastor, Chris Downs, the senior pastor of the church, to open the Word of God with you this morning and to share with you some beautiful truths about Jesus that I think will help us in the days that we're living in right now. I'd like you for you to I'd like you to turn with me in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 17. I'm going to read a few verses until we get to our, our text verse, and I'll let you know when we're there. And we're going to pray as you're turning to First Chronicles, chapter 17, verse 1. Heavenly Father, I just come before you today in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for the privilege and for the opportunity to open up thy holy word, uh, the word of God written. We thank you for the living word of God, which is Christ himself. And I pray that you would reveal both the written and the living word of God to us. Lord Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, use me and help us that you might build us a house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It says in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1, uh, It came to pass, as David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. Then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thy heart, for God is with thee. And it came to pass that same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. Now turn with me to verse 9 of the same chapter. Also I will ordain a place for my people, God is speaking, Israel, and I will plant them, and they shall dwell in their place, and they shall be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more as at the beginning. As, and since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, moreover I will subdue all thine enemies. Furthermore I tell thee that the Lord will build thee an house. I want to key in on that thought for this is the topic this is the theme of our message today. Furthermore, I tell thee, as God is speaking, the Lord will build thee a house. Verse 11, And it shall come to pass when thy days be expired that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. So what we see here 
is we see here some 700 years before Jesus Christ came to this earth, Almighty God, through the, the womb of the Virgin, through the Holy Spirit, there was a king some 700 years before that named King David, and we know the exploits of King David very well. Um, and one of the exploits toward the end of his life was that he wanted to build a house, a temple for God to dwell in. He said, I dwell in a house of cedar, but God dwells in tents and in curtains. It was God's mind to move amongst the children of Israel in a, a tabernacle, a wilderness tabernacle that would move to and fro. Uh, and it was, in David's heart, he thought to build God a permanent building or a temple in Jerusalem. But the Lord came to David at night and he said, David, you're not going to build me a house. I want to let you know that I'm going to build you a house. And the person that I'm going to do this through is your son. You remember Solomon was born, his son who would become the throne, the, the heir to the throne of King David upon his death and who would reign uh, in uh, Jerusalem in David's uh, stead would be the one that would physically build this house, King Solomon. You remember, it was King Solomon born of Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the uh, wife of another man who David murdered that man and had this wife, Bathsheba, to have a son. And their second child was Solomon. And Solomon is now, through the mercy of God, going to become the king over Israel and also is going to build this house. Now, this word house has to do with a family. It has to do with a kingdom. It has to do with a temple. And so today we want to say in the title of our message, Jesus will build for you three things I want to focus on today. A house for you a church for you, and a kingdom for himself, which we will be able to enjoy. The Bible says as far as Jesus building us a house, we just read, I will build for you a house. And that prophecy was to King David and to his son, but we read that it is forever. This house will be built forever, and it's a picture of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, reigning in the temple, Solomon's temple being reconstructed. So we know that God is able to build a house. We know that God is able to build a church. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we know that he's able to build a kingdom for in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, as Solomon is building the temple, it is said that this temple, this house, will become a kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, speaking of Solomon, and I will be his father. Now he's speaking of Christ as well. He, meaning Christ, will build a house for my name. And God the Father speaking of his son as David spoke of his son Solomon. He, being Christ, will build a house for my name and he shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So we see that there's a house, a church, and a kingdom. Let's talk about ourself for a minute. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that you are a house. It says you are built as a spiritual house. We as lively stones. Even as Solomon built this temple out of cedar wood and gold and silver, and he had a throne of ivory covered with gold, a house that is built of stone, we also are built 
a spiritual house of living stones, sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ. And God wants to build you a house. This message that I preached, uh, I was in India some few years ago and was invited to come by the pastor of many, many different churches. I would call him an apostle in India, Reverend J.T. Norman. He invited me to come and to preach in his Bible school and in some of his churches. And on Sunday morning, God gave me this message. I will give you, the, give you a house. I will build you a house. And little did I know, but there was a dear woman who was praying for her brother to come back home. Hadn't seen him in years, was brokenhearted. He was wandering. He, he once was in the church. A member of the church had wandered away. And the family of God was broken for this brother. And the family proper was broken for this brother. And as I was preaching this message, as Jesus was ministering this message through my mouth, I should say, the Spirit of God drew this brother back. Nobody had seen him for years. And he came walking into the church and said, I'm here, and began to greet his sister and the family and the people of God rejoiced and worshiped the Lord for bringing this brother home. May I tell you that God wants to restore or build you a house in a similar way. For we've been racked, we've been crushed under the weight of COVID. But God himself wants to build you a house. And he is the one that wants to do the work. For the work has already been accomplished through the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he died upon Calvary and shed his blood. You know, if there's one thing that we need to hear is that Jesus Christ wants to give you rest through the work that he already accomplished to build you a house, to build your house in the midst of this coronavirus that has racked us all. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. May I tell you that today in your house, Jesus wants to bring rest to you. And how does he bring rest into your home, into your family, into your loved ones, into your circumstances, into our church? How does he do that? It says, for unto us was the gospel preached. Now the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The good news of what Christ wants to do in men's heart. It says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Let's mix the gospel with faith. Let's trust in Jesus who finished the work before the foundation of the world. He knew where you would be today and all the needs in your house. And he has finished the work of taking care of your house and your loved ones before he even formed the earth, because it was before he formed the earth that he determined that he would go to an old rugged cross and there he would die and shed his blood and heal your soul, your mind, your heart, and your home and your family. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 3, For we which have believed do enter into rest, do you believe on Jesus today? Then enter into his rest. Just take a deep breath and a sigh of relief and say, Jesus took care of everything in this COVID and the world that we live in today as a result of what he did at Calvary 2,000 years ago. It says, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished, from the foundation of the world, Jesus has already done all the work to build you a house. And I want you to just rest in that today. 
For Jesus said in John 19, 30, his last words upon the cross, it is finished. <coughs> and he bowed his head <coughs> and gave up the ghost. <coughs> Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus said, come unto me and find rest. Come unto me, all you who are heavy, <coughs> weary, <coughs> and are labor, laboring, and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, <coughs> and my burden is light. He also said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, the Apostle Paul said, Not as you have always obeyed in my absence, but also in my presence, but you are required now to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You would say, I'm tired, I'm weary of laboring and building to work out my own salvation. Perhaps your home has been struck with the COVID virus. Your heart may be grieving over someone who you love, who has lost their life. You miss them. Your heart is crushed and broken. Tears. You're scared or um, tremendously overwhelmed, I should say, regarding what will happen to your home that you live in. Some 40 million Americans thinking of their home being taken away. Perhaps you're not sure where the next rent or the next meal is going to come from. Your family has been ripped apart or torn apart over being shuttered in and all the weaknesses of a family have come to the forefront and it's been hurting you and, and burdening you. God said, yes, we are required to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And that could be in the means of prayer and in the means of worship and in the means of studying this precious, wonderful book. However, we must not think that our prayer alone or our worship or our act of studying the Bible is what is going to build us the house. The work has already been accomplished on Calvary's cross. Our prayer is because we believe in Jesus that he's already done the work and we're asking that work to flow into our hearts. I pray you can say amen. Our purpose in studying the word of God is to know God more and the work that has already been accomplished at Calvary's cross, the benefits that we can learn how to walk in those benefits. We worship God not to earn anything from Him, not to work out our salvation through worship, but God makes it clear that we're thanking Him and blessing Him for already doing the work. Yes, we are required to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, but I want you to key on verse 13, the very next verse that tells us where to build or where to work out our own salvation. The Bible says in Philippians 2, verse 13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Can I say that again? For it is God who is working in you. It is God who is building you. It is God who is restoring, for the word build means to restore. It is God through your faith in Jesus. The work has already been done. Let him build. Let him do it in you. Trust him. Rest, rest, rest. Let your prayers be prayers of rest not prayers of earning anything from God. Let your worship be words of thanksgiving and praise, not to earn His presence, but His presence has already been granted to you through the work that has been accomplished at Calvary. I pray that that ministers to you. For it is God who wants to restore and bring your house through sickness, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 5, 
with his stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 says his own body, he bare our sins upon the tree. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Luke 4.40 says that Jesus had brought all that had any sick. As they were brought to him, he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. <clears throat> I just read, uh, watch on the 700 Club. You can go and Google it. Jesus heals from the coronavirus. Did you hear what I said? Jesus heals from the coronavirus. You look it up. There's a report on the 700 Club of a man whose lungs were filled with fluid, but he believed the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. He said God breathed into his lungs while he was sleeping alone in his hospital room very, very late at night. And he felt the fluid. He felt the pressure lift the next day. The doctors came in and said, your lungs were filled with fluid, but there's hardly anything in there anymore. And within two days, he was released from the hospital. And we believe that as you come back together at Crossway Worship Center, that in love, we're in Jesus' name, we're going to lay hands on the sick and they are going to recover. Maybe there's been grief or sorrow as a result of the COVID disease. And it is not to be understated. It is not to be um, minimized for your heart is crushed and you have shedding tears for people that you love and that you miss so dearly. The same Jesus who died on the cross not only did the work of healing to build you, but he did the work of restoration. He said in Isaiah 53 verse 5, he himself was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. He carried them 2,000 years ago. He lived your pain on the cross, your grief and your sorrow, as you may have said goodbye to someone that you love. He bore that grief. Let him carry it. Through the Spirit, let him lift the burden. The Bible says that he is the God of all comfort. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort. Would you let him comfort you right now? Let him build your house again. He's the God of all comfort who comforts you in all our tribulation that we may be comforted with the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. We may comfort others with the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Let God comfort you today. He promises to not only restore your house as the people who dwell in it, but the place where you physically reside. I love this verse in Psalm 37, verse 25, I have been old, David said. I've been young and I haven't been old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Exodus 1, 21 talks about the midwives who feared God when Moses was and his uh, brothers who were, his lives were taken uh, by Pharaoh, but they feared God. The midwives refused to turn the children over to Pharaoh. And the Bible says as a result of that, he made them houses. If God can make multiple houses, I want you to trust the blood that Jesus shed on the cross has a house in preparation for you. Believe him, trust him. I trust and pray in Jesus' name that he provide Anyone who needs a home to dwell in right now, even a homeless person would find a home, for we love the homeless in Jesus' name. It's also a restoration of provision for the things that dwell in the house. I know that we're all very, very concerned of the rent, the 
some 40 million Americans are going to have difficulty paying rent. That is an unbelievable statement where they fear that because they lack the provision, they may not be able to dwell in that place they live in. I want you to believe the Lord right now. Believe in Jesus. He loves you. Put your faith and your trust in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection to provide for all of your mental, emotional, physical, and yes, financial needs. Jesus said in the Oh, sorry, the Bible says of Christ regarding the book of Philippians that our pastor is doing a marvelous work of working our way through. But my God, in Philippians 4.19, uh, 4, I'm sorry, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Trust Jesus to be your banker. It is his glory is his riches all the silver and all the gold belong to him and if he could fling the universe out with just a word he can care for you financially jesus said take no thought for your life what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear what you're going to put on he said for all these things the gentiles seek but seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Take no thought for the morrow, for sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Yes, prayer is a wonderful gift that God has given us to communicate with Christ. And prayer is, is necessary. I once said it's not essential because the work is what's essential of, of Calvary and what he did there, but prayer is necessary. And I remember praying about a need that I had as I was burdened about how I was going to pay for my daughter's college education as I was in the ministry in Niagara Falls and yet had to work a second job by leaving my family many weeks out of the year and going to New York City and working and flying back and forth, being away from them and, and not not wondering that God was in the process of doing something wonderful. And on the day we took Hannah, on our first day to go to the physical college that she went to in Evangel University, I remember being in, <clears throat> being in the bedroom early in the morning and getting a text from someone in the church. We never asked for anything. We never requested anything, but miraculously there was a text that showed that there was a provision for $2,000, a check made payable to me for $2,000. And I woke up my wife, I said, honey, look what God just did for us. I remember asking, because I knew who did it, <laughs> uh, personal friends of ours, I, I tried to give the money back when we got home. And the answer that my friends gave me was, listen, this money didn't come from us. It came from Jesus. He told us that we were to give you this check. Listen, if God can provide for me to take the first steps in getting my daughter into college and who after gave me all the work that I needed to take care of her and my family, God can provide for you. Do you trust him today? Let his peace, let rest come over your emotional, mental, well-being, your social well-being regarding your family and your friends. It's a house of relationships to be restored. I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a family. David was told by God, I'm going to build you a family. Your son's going to build that kingdom. He's going to be the start of the kingdom, which some 700 years later, through son after son being born to Solomon, God was then going to bring Jesus to the earth. God would be his father. Jesus, the son of God, almighty God, would leave heaven's throne through the womb of the virgin and he would be born so that he could go, go to the cross, live a sinless life, and go to the cross and resurrect from the dead to save us all. 
but it's Jesus who wants to restore every broken relationship in your family. Listen to this wonderful promise in Malachi 3.6, the last promise of the Old Testament, the last verse of the Old Testament. If this isn't saying something beautiful, I don't know what is. And he, meaning God, will turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Oh, if you're having struggle in your family, the Lord is able to build your house. He's able to turn everyone's heart back to God and back to one another. Children back to their fathers and fathers back to their children. I said children back to their fathers and fathers back to their children. That's what he promised to do. He would turn the hearts. Turn the hearts of our young people and our nation back to the previous generation that we can all be at peace. Jesus is able to do that. In your home, he's able for husbands to love their wives even as Christ loved the church. He's able to put in a husband for his wife and love for his children, a love that Jesus has for his church that would go to the cross and seek nothing in return. Jesus is able to do that. In particular, in particular, a wife, I'm sorry, a husband is to love his wife as himself, and a wife see that she reverence or honor her husband. God is able to bring honor and restoration back, a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband. Isn't that beautiful? Now listen, not only is God able to build a house, but he's able to build a church. On the very spot where the Lord... God Almighty chose to build Solomon's temple through David's heart preparation and through the physical work of King Solomon. There was a beautiful act that took place in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21, if you know the story, says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, Israel had been doing some sinful things, but David's numbering of the children of Israel was especially egregious to God. He, told, he, he, he says that the Lord was very grieved with him. David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I've numbered the troops, because I've done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly, as David prays unto God. What was it that caused David to do this thing, to number the troops, and why is it so wrong? I think the answer to it is found in the previous chapter um, because David, in verse 8 of chapter 20, these were born unto the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Could it be that David began to take account of his own strength, his own wisdom, his own might, his own resources? He thought how I myself have taken down the giant. These were the actual relatives of Goliath, forgetting that it was God himself who took Goliath down. David just slung a stone. But God, the Lord Jesus Christ, through David's stone, took the giant down. And later in David's life, I think he began to be filled with pride and think that he and his family had taken Goliath and all of his relatives down and began to number the troops. In other words, to see if he could amass how mighty his army really was after he was just a shepherd boy one day. Now he's the king. And he numbers the troops, and there are perhaps almost a million people or more that, that David had at his disposal. But God said he was very, very grieved. And as a result of that, the Lord sent an angel to David and was very upset with David. It says in verse 15, And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. 
And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented into the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, It's enough. Stay now your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. King David, actually as a result of numbering the troops, did far more harm than he ever could have imagined in his relationship with Bathsheba and even murdering Uriah the Hittite. The Bible says that as a result of David numbering the troops and God becoming upset about all of this, the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. Can you imagine having that on your conscience, that the Lord would place under your responsibility, under the work of your own hands, resulting in the death of 70,000 people because you numbered the troops? Now, God was angry with the children of Israel, and it was a combined effort of David's sin and the people's sin that the angel of the Lord, which could be the pre-incarnate Christ himself, came down to do harm to Israel. But there was mercy found in the eyes of the Lord. And God came to the prophet and told him to go to that threshing floor of that man Aaron, Aaronal or Ornan, the Jebusite, where the angel was standing with his sword drawn, go to the threshing floor in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, verse 18. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he had spake in the name of the Lord. And what did David do there? In verse 26, and David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord, and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord, in verse 27, commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheaf thereof. So not only did David want to build a house in his own strength, which God said no, but David wanted to number the troops in his own strength, and this horrible event happens, and God says, go and build an altar and sacrifice blood there to me on the threshing floor. And when David repented and sacrificed blood, a burnt offering of an oxen, and lit it on fire before the Lord, and peace offerings of animals, much blood being shed as an atonement for his sin, the fire of God came down from heaven and communed with David. Now, one of the most amazing events that I can think of in Scripture is where God chooses to build Solomon's temple or to build the house. Can you imagine the wonder of God in 2 Chronicles chapter 3 to choose of all places the event of David's greatest failure to build Solomon's temple. Look, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. The Lord God Almighty chose to build Solomon's temple where Solomon would sit and reign, and where Christ would sit and rule and reign on David's greatest moral and ethical and familial failure, where 70,000 people died, but he offered a blood sacrifice, and God forgave him and reestablished the kingdom in his hand through his son Solomon. This is the most wonderful, beautiful um, acts of of mercy to be displayed to us in the Old Testament. And it's a picture of how Jesus Christ, who is the King, the kingdom that would come through the reign of Solomon, Jesus being born 
and dying upon the cross would shed his blood. And in the moment of your greatest failure, yes, right in the event surrounding your greatest failures, the greatest hurts that you may have done to others and that you are ashamed of, and you have a hard time facing it. It hurts you so bad. You want to run away in, 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 um, and cower away from those events that you've done. And you think about them often. But it is the blood of Jesus Christ, the King, who sits upon His throne, who shed His blood at the cross and washed us clean from all of our sin and caused us to be born again that we become the temple of the living God, the church of the living God. And He restores us, and He makes us new, and He heals us, and He uses us for His kingdom. Listen to what the Bible says. This cup, Jesus said, is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The greatest failure brought to Christ can be the greatest work that Christ will do in your life. And he can reestablish you as he reestablished David and his son. Now Solomon never stopped shedding blood in the temple, nor should we ever take our eyes off of the work of Christ in the church regarding the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood. Hallelujah. Preach Christ and him crucified. For the work was done there. The Spirit of God moves upon those who preach the cross. And I'm so glad that our pastor has had it in his heart to name our church Crossway Worship Center. Yes, we worship Christ, for Christ's cross is the way. Now listen, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, when Solomon, who had finished building the house, then thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver and the gold and the instruments that he put among the treasures of the house. That the very thing he did once he built this beautiful, magnificent structure out of gold and silver and wood and ivory and um, beautiful blue and purple and linen, scarlet and mirroring the wilderness tabernacle for effect and for function. The Bible says in King Solomon in verse 6, in all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark, sacrificed sheep and oxen which could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And a later portion of scripture describes how he sacrificed 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep blood being shed constantly at the altar that's what brings the atonement that's what is the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross the blood that he shed and when Solomon shed the blood and when he worshiped and when he prayed it was the very fire of God that came down listen the Bible says in 2nd Chronicles chapter 5 verses 13 and 14 it came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one, thank God for the oneness of the body of Christ at Crossway, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, when they lifted up their voices with trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and they praised the Lord, saying, He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. This is a picture of how the Holy Spirit can work in our lives to bring us freedom from besetting sins. Bring us freedom from the things that we want to stop doing and bring us freedom to do the things that we need to do to empower us for only the Holy Ghost can do these things. It shows that the priests 
didn't need to stand anymore to minister because the glory of the Lord was doing the work to please the Lord. It was the blood sacrifice that the fire of God fell down upon. Listen, it is the New Testament that God builds the church upon the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us never forget the blood. Solomon sacrificed offerings before the Lord every day, at every Sabbath, at every new moon, at every feast, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Passover celebrating our present day celebration of the cross, the Feast of Weeks, which is the celebration of our present day Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is our rapture and our eternal dwelling. Blood, blood, blood being shed before God. Our faith must be in the one-time sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The one-time sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Through faith, the glory of God will be revealed in you. And you will be able to do and accomplish things in victory that you've never been able to do. Things that we cannot do in our own strength or our own ability. May we not number the troops but may we number our great God and Savior Jesus Christ and His resources. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Listen, if you are a believer, the power of God in me is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in verse 17, For the just shall live by faith. That it is written, the just shall live by faith. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Listen, put your faith in Jesus. The work of the church is to preach the beautiful cross, his burial, his resurrection, and let the Spirit of God do the work that we cannot have never been able to do. God works in us to do and to will of his good pleasure. Hallelujah. Oh, there's so much that I could share. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 says regarding sin and that which dwelled in him, what I do, I allow not. Have you ever just done something, said something, acted away, and you don't know why you did it? That's what Paul was saying of himself. He said, what I do, I allow not. Let's read it together. What I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. How much I want to do for Jesus, but I find myself not doing it. But what I hate, that I do. Maybe that's the willful acts of the sinful nature. Now he goes on to say in verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That is an amazing statement. I want you to think about that. The Apostle Paul is saying that there is an aspect of our humanity that will never be removed from us until we die and this body is buried in the ground or raptured. It is the principle of sin that dwells from Adam to us. And it dwelled in the Apostle Paul and it dwells in us, and we cannot put it under unless it be by the Holy Spirit. You may have some victory in avoiding things or doing things in your own strength for a short season of time, but we must realize that we cannot accomplish the building of God's house as the church or our family unless the Spirit of God does it through faith in what happened at Calvary. Galatians 5, 24 and 25 says, For they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and with its lusts. Listen, the, the, the power of Jesus to bring us into complete conformity with his 
work in building us is done through our faith in believing that we have been crucified with Christ. But nevertheless, we live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 5.25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Hallelujah! It's walking in the Spirit. So as we continuously, moment by moment, say, Lord, I cannot. Lord, I cannot be the man. I cannot be the father. I cannot be the minister. I cannot be the teacher. I cannot be the helper that you have called me to be. Unless the Spirit of God do it in me. But Lord, send the fire of the Spirit as I emphasize the blood the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ and the work that has already been done. And I rest in that work. And the Spirit of God makes the transformation in me as I present myself with loving grace before Him. Prayer is presenting myself before God, seeking His face, knowing He's there, saying, Lord, I see You. Lord, through the Spirit of God, work in me. Bring your rest to bear in my spirit and change me from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord, the Bible says, that we're transformed into His image and likeness from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. God wants to minister to His people through the Spirit. Jesus went to his own hometown, like we're going to return to Crossway and Trackside very, very soon. And he stood up and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel. See, it's in the gospel. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection. Preach the gospel to the poor. Sent us to heal the brokenhearted. Bring deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Christ wants to bring to his church healing from a broken heart. Listen, there are people who are going to come into our congregation who we have to be essential workers on as a hospital. And we're going to need, through the work of the Holy Spirit, to help and heal the broken hearts. Deliverance, as I just preached to the captives. To believe for instantaneous and miraculous healing of recovery of sight to the blind as we preach the gospel, as we love Jesus and preach his work as death, his burial, his resurrection. It's him, it's him, it's him. He will heal the signs and wonders confirming the word. As our pastor preaches, God will heal the sick. I saw it with my own eyes, a physical miracle happening right before my eyes, the healing of a knee. I've heard of testimony of brain cancer and cerebral palsy being relieved. I know that our sisters have prayed in the name of Jesus for people to be miraculously healed. Let them come to the church and find Jesus and we'll pray for those who may have the virus that Jesus will heal to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. We're going to be a family. Those that are bruised sometimes are bruised within the walls of their own household and they're coming to us. We're going to tell them that Jesus wants to heal your broken heart through his Holy Spirit. Would you let him as we lift up Christ and what he did it for us at Calvary. All the gifts of the Spirit are given for the profit of everyone else. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, For one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, prophecy, miracles, discerning of spirits, ah, 
tongues, even interpretation of tongues. Notice none of those gifts, faith to believe for others. Tongues is not even to be spoken in the public service unless there be an interpretation because God wants to make sure that we're not doing anything from a selfish motive, but we're doing it for others. The Spirit of God works in others. The kingdom of God is also belonging to Christ. Solomon was told that he would build a kingdom. Christ would build a kingdom through him. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 23. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and raiment and harness and spices and horses and mules and arrayed every day. Verse 25 says that out of Jerusalem, in verse 26, he reigned over all the kings from the river even unto the land of the Philistines and unto the border of Egypt. This picture of King Solomon, God building a house and a church and a kingdom is the picture of Jesus ruling and reigning over the earth, ruling from Jerusalem for a thousand years of his literal presence, the resurrected Christ on earth. Listen, you're hearing on the news the disheartening things that are happening in the world, the nations, the kingdoms, and people who are trying to stop the name of Jesus from ever being spoken May I tell all of them that Jesus Christ is going to return on a white horse after he has brought trouble, after he has, or allowed trouble, not brought trouble, but allowed trouble, after he has raptured his church, and after he has brought judgment, then he will come on a white horse, and he will have a sharp-edged sword, and those that are with him, he will rule nations with the rod of iron. We will come with him. Those who are with him are chosen and faithful and true. And he will ride upon a white horse, vanquishing all of his enemies. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And when he rules in Jerusalem, not only will he take sickness away in his eternal heaven, but for a thousand years he will rule and he will take COVID and all diseases away. The Bible says in Isaiah 65 verse 20 of his rule out of Jerusalem, no more will there be an infant of days for a child will die at a hundred years old. In other words, everyone that is living at that time in that reign of his kingdom for a thousand years will live and have very wonderful health. The wolf will lay down with the lamb and the child will play on the hole of the asp. Listen, there's going to be a revolution of nature as the wolf lays down with the lion and the lamb and they all are together loving one another and ministering to one another. No more will there be predator and prey. No more will God allow any more unrest, any more anarchism or uh, unruliness going in the streets destroying things, uh, burning things. No more will Christ allow this. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 11 that no one will hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. And the kingdoms of the earth will come and we will rule and reign with Christ. In 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 1, it says not only did Solomon rule in this temple, rule in this house, but all the riches and the wisdom of God were upon him because he sought the Lord in prayer and in worship, remembering the blood sacrifice. And the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon. Can I stop there for a minute? The queen of Sheba came to King Solomon. The nations of the earth will come to Jesus. And the queen of Sheba represents Ethiopia. A dear black queen. Listen, God wants to bring all the nations together. Solomon was of the white side of a skin tone. Sheba was of the darker side of a skin tone. 
But Queen Sheba fell down at Solomon's feet for the wisdom that God had given. God is able in Christ to bring all nations together. When Jesus rules, there will be no more racism. Hallelujah. Revelation 7, 9 says that all nations and all kindreds and all peoples and all tongues will come together and worship God, having palm branches in their hands, singing glory and honor and praise to Him. The mantra, the word that we live by this present day, waiting for Jesus to rule and reign, is Acts 10, 26. The Bible says that Christ made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the earth. Listen, I do not see the skin color of man. When I was a pastor in Niagara Falls, I said that to my congregation, and we had many races under the shadow of our roof, and we loved one another. Listen, the color that we need to be involved with in relation to each other is red, the color of our blood. We all bleed red, and it is all the blood of Jesus who bled red upon the cross that brings reconciliation to the races. It was said of Queen Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, that when she saw in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, Solomon sitting upon his throne, there was no more spirit left in her. She fell down and was in awe. And it says in 2 Chronicles 9, 5, it was true report which I heard in my own land of your acts and of your wisdom. Howbeit in verse 6, I believed not their words until I came, and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou exceedest the fame that I heard. Solomon's glory brought the queen of Sheba to believe on God Almighty. And even so, we, as we come together in one, as the races unite together in one under the name of Jesus, we will preach the gospel. We will tell the wonderful story of Jesus and his love. How he loves the young and how he loves the old. How he loves every nation, every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every color of skin from every part of this world. And we love you too. For in Crossway, every nation, every race is welcome and we will learn of your culture and hope to understand it better, to honor you. I can tell you that one of the finest men that I know is now home in heaven. He's a gentleman of a, another race. He was a beautiful black man. He and I were dear friends. And he was paralyzed from his waist down with cerebral palsy. And we would care for one another and we would love one another and I would help him in every way that I could. And we had a dear relationship. And he was someone who would want me to go with him, he and I together under the love of Jesus, with his wheelchair going up and down the streets telling as many people as we could find, that Jesus loves you. Jesus will bring you help. Jesus will bring you hope. Jesus will build and restore your house. And Mike's house was, was destroyed over things that he had done and, and had transacted a cerebral palsy, but he found Jesus. And he was able to say, like the Queen of Sheba said of Solomon, happy are your men, and happy are these your servants, which stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. And Mike and I would share the love of Jesus. We would share each other's burdens and pray with one another. We loved each other dearly. Mike is home in heaven, where we're all going to go. For those of us who believe on Jesus, and we have the privilege of telling the world that Christ wants to build your house. Christ wants to build our church. Christ wants to build his kingdom of love in you. And in the next few days, we're going to be able, 
I believe it's not this Sunday, if not the next one, we're going to be able to gather back in trackside and stand on the beautiful grass in the outdoors and proclaim like Mike and I did as one, as my brothers and sisters will do as one of every tribe and kindred and tongue that Jesus wants to build your house. Jesus wants to build us a church of love in the city of Wilton. And I wonder if you'd pray with me now. Pray with me now to receive Christ, this wonderful God who promises to build you a house, restore your house, build us a church founded upon the precious sacrifice of Christ. As he's building a kingdom in this world, he's going to take care of us as things get more difficult. But we believe in him and we trust him. Would you pray with me today? If you've not yet asked Christ into your heart to be your Lord and to be your Savior, to forgive you of all your sins, today you can be born again. Today Christ will save you and minister to you in a, a real and a beautiful and a magnificent way. Would you pray with me? Say, Heavenly Father, repeat after me, I know that I have sinned. And I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Wash me in your blood. Forgive me and make me clean. I turn away from my sins and I turn to you. I invite you to be my king, to be my Lord, and to be my Savior. And I believe that one day I will see you in heaven, face to face, as with the rest of my days, I live for you with all my heart. Jesus, I love you, and I thank you for saving me. Father, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer to get together with us, we're so glad becoming a part of the family of God, and we want to invite you to reach out to our pastor that he might pray with you and be able to minister to you further. And we're going to turn a service back over to our worship leader, Beverly, and she's going to lead us in the song, waiting here for you. Just wait on the Lord in his wonderful presence. Let him give you the rest to rebuild you as you put your faith in Christ. He loves you and cares for you. Let the Spirit of God do it in you. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Have a wonderful week.
everything and your faithfulness is true. Thank you. 